Right now, we're so excited to have Heather Lewis join us today to share her knowledge, her tips, and her tricks. And I want to give you a brief introduction to her before I pass it on to her. So Heather Lewis is a partner at Animal Arts, an architecture firm that exclusively designs veterinary hospitals, animal shelters, and other animal care facilities. She's worked on hundreds of projects across the country and beyond, both large and small, in her 23 years with the firm, including award-winning hospitals for the PARC Vet and Prescott Animal Hospital. She also is the architect for one of the most, or for one of the first fear-free certified practices, Loyal Companions in St. Charles, Illinois. Heather worked with Dr. Becker, who is also my dad, and the Fear Free team on the development of the facility standards for veterinary hospitals. And I can also say, personally, I've been on some of the calls with Heather Lewis, with my father, and with Temple Grandin as we walk through what a Fear Free space may look like. So I love how Heather has incorporated a lot of those designs into what she does. Heather has dedicated her career to creating spaces that bring people and animals together. So without further ado, I will go ahead and pass it on to you, Heather. So I want to start by saying that the surrounding built environment affects us all. And I feel sorry for this poor fellow on the airplane because I spend a lot of time on airplanes and I know that the built environment can be both uplifting and really difficult. Um, and we want to look for uplifting both for the people who are working in the space, but also for the animals we're caring for. And of course, we're going to focus on the animals today. There's a researcher in the UK who's studying the effects of environmental noises in buildings. And by that, I mean the noises that buildings make inherently. And he's been looking at this for about 10 years. And apparently buildings make all kinds of shrieking and terrible noises outside the realm of human hearing, which is a terrible thing to think about. And it affects a lot of people who have sensitive hearing, but it also affects pets. And that's a real concern because pets hear much higher frequencies than we do. So as an architect, what I'm looking for and what I think is the incredibly inspiring message here is not how we make buildings fancier or more expensive. It's how we really focus on what buildings do to support the relationships that we have with each other and with pets. And that is the the life-changing message in this is that it's not about building buildings, it's about building relationships. If we know, for example, that we can eliminate the noises that buildings make, then we should do that because we make better buildings. So these ideas apply to any practice and the results are truly transformative. We know from lots of evidence in human health care that the results are transformative. So this is a great way to start this discussion. I grew up in the days of Nurse Ratchet, I believe, and uh, those were the days when people pretty much held you down to treat you. And now human hospitals, especially children's hospitals, are so much friendlier than they used to be. And we have a whole body of evidence-based design that, upon which we can refer. And this has been incredibly transformative to human health care. And why do hospital groups want to make better spaces? Because they get outcomes. And they get outcomes for human patients, which then looks better for the hospital. So jumping in then to what we do, for pet hospitals and looking at this building relationships idea, let's dive right in. Throughout this slideshow, I'm going to use beautiful animal arts pets. So all the transition slides have pets from our employees and from our office. And I'll talk about a few of them as we go. But I wanna start with non-slip flooring, which is a huge, huge topic. When we had the pleasure of collaborating with Dr. Temple Grandin, who, you know, I, um, I am so starstruck by her. I just thought it was an incredible life-changing experience to work with her. I think that one of the things that stuck with me the most that she said was that the fear of falling is a primal fear. And for those of you who've woken up in the middle of the night with that falling dream, and it's absolutely terrifying, you know that, that that fear goes to your brainstem and it takes all of the thinking away from you. It robs you of anything but the fear. And when a pet is coming into an unknown space, they already are fearful. So they're already kind of working without as much frontal lobe. And then if you slip while you're in that space, and this can even happen to us if, you know, if we slip or trip, 
then it can immediately take us to that terrible fear. And then you're not having any communication at all at that point. So we want to eliminate that primal fear by designing much, much better spaces and also eliminating anything that they can slip on, you know, on surfaces. So for example, flooring, grooming tubs, exam tables, all of those are so easy to modify with mats. They hardly cost any money to get all those spaces working so that they're safe. And I'm going to talk more about flooring in particular. We should also consider the treatment room because this is the area where the pet is more likely to be fearful is in treatment because there's a lot of unknown things happening in this space and lots of visual stimulus and auditory stimulus and smells. So this is a great space to focus on for slip reduction. This is a fear-free accredited practice here um, in Texas. And this wonderful practice, you can see how they're using the mats on the table to create the fear-free experience um, for this pet that's being examined right here. So let's talk about flooring in particular. Again, referencing human healthcare. In human healthcare, we have um, the situation where many people slip, trip, and fall in hospitals. And this results in literal millions, if not even billions of dollars in litigation um, in the United States. And while that's a terrible situation, that legal pressure has put a lot of pressure on manufacturers to come up with safer products that can be used in healthcare. And fortunately, those products also work pretty well in animal healthcare. We tend to use our spaces even harder than they do in human healthcare buildings. Like for example, we might need to hose down a space. So not all this, the flooring products are, are great, but many of them are. And I'll just call out a couple. If I call out products or systems in this, in this webinar, um, we have no financial aff affiliation to anything, just giving you ideas. So on the left is a non-slip vinyl flooring, and the non-slip vinyl flooring is made by a company called Altro, A-L-T-R-O, and they're one of the first to come into this market. Now there are many other products that you can purchase, but I'm bringing them up because the product is also non-wax. So having a non-wax, antimicrobial, healthcare quality flooring that is easy to clean, that you don't have a lot of um, maintenance on. It's just a wonderful improvement for our business. And we expect to see more and more products along these lines. The other kind of product we can use is rubber flooring. And rubber is a really interesting material in and of itself because rubber trees make natural resins and those resins are antimicrobial. That's how the rubber trees protect themselves in the jungle is by having antimicrobial resins within their own bodies, if you can call a tree a body. And we can then use these resins to make products and these products are wonderful. So on the right is a, um, is a treatment space that's also kind of like a training space for dogs and that's a sports rubber floor. We can get rubber products that have a smooth surface on top that can be heat welded, that would be good for surgery spaces. They also tend to be kind of uh, cushy, so they're good to stand on for a while. Uh, they can have cushioning underneath the surface as well. The only downside of rubber products, the only reason we don't use them all the time, is they have to be gently cleaned. So if you want to use your rescue product or whatever else on the floor, and it's not pH neutral, this may not be the product for you but there are wonderful products on the market, which is the whole point of that conversation. So if we can eliminate the slips, trips, and falls, we are already creating a better relationship, not only with pets, but also potentially their, their pet parents as well. So now let's jump into how we craft the actual hospital. And I love the way the accreditation standards have been set up because they're kind of front to back. So we can think about the entry experience and then the treatment experience and then the housing experience and it all makes quite a lot of sense. So we'll start with the entry experience. And many of the things that are in the standards are fairly um, easy to achieve, i.e. if you put some, some thought and care into it, they're not high value products in terms of cost. So all of this can be done but again, I want to show how we can also build the environment itself to set the stage for incredible care. 
So one of the things we can do is think a little bit about layout. And I've been in this business now for 24 years, and I remember hospitals that were designed where they were sort of bifurcated. And they were cut in half with a cat side and a dog side. And that was the thing we did in the 1990s. And um, they didn't always work very well because people come in, they've got a cat and a dog, and then it's confusing and it's hard to, for the staff to communicate each other, with each other in a space that's cut down the middle. So now we try to think about that in a more flexible format. Can we create a feline side and a canine side of the hospital, but not cut it right in half? Can we create separate spaces, but it still allow the staff members to communicate? So that's really the question. And different hospitals are designed in different ways for the philosophy of that practice. This particular practice that we worked with is also an accredited practice, and they were absolutely incredible. This is Loyal Companions. Um, it's outside of Chicago. I recommend looking them up and following them on social media because they just do such an incredible job with pets. And um, what I like is they took it pretty far and they wanted to. So this is a split lobby with a cat lobby and a dog lobby. And it's got a sliding door so the staff members can go between the two spaces so that they can serve customers appropriately. And then what is always awkward is that there are not the same number of cat and dog patients on any day. So the exam room that you can see in the corner of this picture is one that can go either way. So it can be deep cleaned and used as a dog exam space or a cat exam space, depending on the needs for the day. So that's a pretty cool floor plan technique. Many hospitals don't wanna go that far and they don't have to. So this is a great example of something that's much simpler, which is a screen that separates cats and dogs. So there's a cat waiting area behind that lovely screen there. And then some practices do less than that, but are still able to separate patients and reduce fear, anxiety, and stress by using furniture separators. And when you pair this with the idea that pets in a fear-free setting try to move to exam rooms as quickly as possible and not hang out in the lobby as much as they used to, these kinds of simpler strategies can be fine for the moment that an animal is in that space. Here's another example of how you can use room dividers to separate the pets. This is a little more open visually than I would like, but it, the idea is there. And you can imagine creating um, separators with you know, a reasonable budget. So for Patients that have a lot of fear and anxiety and stress, one of the things we can think about is creating alternate, alternate entrances into the hospital setting. And this is an example of this concept. In fact, one of the things that I love most about working with veterinarians and veterinary hospitals is it's up to you to decide how your practice is going to work. And that kind of personal autonomy is so incredible. And frankly, it's so rare in this world now. I mean, how many, how many uh, human doctors have that kind of autonomy? They're usually part of large hospital groups and they do not. So this is one of the things I love about working in the veterinary space is the spaces vary so much. On the left is a hospital that uses a drive-through garage like a sally port for entry for certain animals. Now, if we look at that table that's in the garage, we can nitpick it and say it should not have a slick surface on top, right? It's so we can modify this a little bit to make it more um, re fear reducing. And maybe we want to work on the floor surface as well. But the idea there that there's an alternate entry is very powerful. On a more reasonable level, we could just have an exam room with an outside door or a nearby outside door to admit some animals directly into the exam environment instead of going through the lobby. This is also really good for behaviorally challenged dogs that may need to come in through a side door if they get reactive in a lobby space. So moving to some other details of the lobby space beyond um, layout is thinking about noise reduction. And you may ask, where's the noise reduction um, in the image? And it is the ceiling. And maybe this is the dorkiest thing to say ever, but ceiling tiles have gotten so much better than they used to. It's unbelievable. So within my lifetime, we used to specify ceiling panels that reduced about 55% of reverberant sound. And now these panels can reduce 90% of reverberant sound 
What's incredible about that is that noise is not a linear scale. It's a logarithmic scale. So these panels have gotten orders of magnitude better than they used to be. So this is an example of a new waiting space that has a ceiling that can reduce a lot of the noise and clattering within that space. Trust me, these panels are amazing. And so gone are the days of the palatial waiting rooms with the hard surface ceilings. We want real noise reduction in these spaces. And then speaking of noise, there's some really amazing new things on the market. One of them is a company called Zounds, and Zounds is science-based music for pets. So this is um, incredibly backed by a veterinary behaviorist, and it is um, sounds that really uh, create a soundscape for reducing anxiety for pets for both cats and dogs. What's neat about this is this is really easy to get. You can get it via an app. You can play it on an iPad. So this is not complicated to try out things like this in your space. And the question is, what is the harm in trying all of these things? To me, Ideas like this are as easy to achieve as plugging in a pheromone dispenser. There's so many things we can try to create this calming environment, even given any budget limitations we might have. So move, now moving on to things that are a little bit beyond basics and may not be in the standards, um, we want to think about what the outdoor environment is for the practice. And I show the picture on the right. It looks really fancy pants, but that building is actually a, a leasehold. It's a tenant improvement. This client just happened to be able to find one that had this wonderful garden out front. And um, this is in Florida, so there are gardens around some of the um, some of the uh, commercial buildings in that state. But if you can find a place where pet parents feel more comfortable walking up to the practice, where there are places to walk pets that can be even better. And then we can also think about alternate ideas for brief waiting periods. So maybe we use an outside porch. This is a wonderful practice in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where porches are very common and part of the sort of built um, infrastructure in a, in a lot of places there. And here's another lovely image of a porch. Of course, if you wanna use a porch, it's best if it's safe. And so there's no potential escape for, for dogs. And of course, we don't wanna have freedom cats. So ideally you're not sitting with a cat in your lap on an outside porch. These are some other ideas that I love. One of the things I'd love to see is getting rid of scale fiascos. And um, one of the animals that I love most dearly are horses. I grew up um, as, I call it a barn rat. So I was always at the barn and we can't force a horse onto a scale. Like if you wanna not win a battle, you're trying to get a horse onto a scale. And that's why in livestock facilities, you find that horse and cattle scales are recessed. And to me, that always made so much sense. So we have been working for years with manufacturers to reassess scales. They don't like doing it, but frankly, I don't care. <laughs> I wanna see that that scale a fiasco is a thing of the past. And here's another example. I like this even better because there's a mat on top of the scale. So it feels sort of less sus to the pet getting onto the surface. You could even pick a mat that is the same color as the flooring around it. And then this practice, this is that same practice in Illinois that I love so much. They they rounded all their corners for dogs so they wouldn't have any surprises going around corners. And, you know, that's above and beyond. But I, I love the idea because it reduces reactivity, surprises, and potential anxiety for pets. So now going to the exam environment, which in my mind is one of the most important spaces in the hospital because this is the space for the relationship between the hospital, the client, and the patient. So I think this is just incredible space to, to look at and design and think about. Um, there's so many wonderful things we can do. And Fear Free gives you ideas and you can take those ideas and check the boxes on all of these, which again are pretty accessible for most uh, general practices. And then also go beyond these to creating truly exceptional spaces to, to take care of pets. So I wanna talk with our cat friends because they get forgotten a lot, but creating 
exceptional spaces for them is perhaps even more important um, than for almost any species. I'm not going to make them, of course, but cats have just incredible fear when coming to a veterinary hospital. And therefore, a lot of parents are not necessarily getting all the care for their for their cats as readily as they are uh, for their dogs. So I really like thinking about these spaces for cats. And here are some wonderful ideas on the left, two images, again, from that practice in outside of Chicago, Loyal Companions. Um, these are pictures from their Facebook page. I will admit that I uh, copy clip them because I love them so much, but they give all their animals treats, putting the treat in treatment, and see this cat in the middle is eating her her little snack while sitting in these wonderful deep window sills that they have in the practice. And this was an old Sherwin Williams. So this is not a fancy building, but they took the windows and really prioritized them for the cat examination spaces, which I think is lovely. And notice there's a bird feeder out there. I call that murder view, <laughs> where the cat can kind of think about all the, um, use their eyes and be the hunters they are and look at the birds and the butterflies outside the window. So. That's pretty neat. And then she uses, the veterinarian uses these boxes, which is on the left side, that the cat can get up into and explore and get on top of. Um, and she uses them for exam. And I'm gonna show that to you in a minute. And then the picture on the right-hand side of the screen is that, um, that veterinary hospital in Texas that I mentioned, and they have climbing structures in their rooms and there are a variety of ways that we can, we can employ those. And so here's an example of how the exam box works. So this is not only lovely for the kitty, it allows for considerate approach and gentle control for the veterinarian. So the cat is not going anywhere very easily, but also this is a really gentle and lovely way to begin an exam. For our dog friends, um, some of the ideas are a little bit different. Again, this practice in Chicago area with the lights off. So the doctor starts with all of her patients with the lights off, um, but the exam rooms have these big windows. And then she turns the lights gently on and raises them as the pet gets more comfortable with the situation, which is lovely. And for the dogs, they use something that I would call an ottoman, but maybe there's a different word for it, which is a low and wide seating thingy that they designed that's near the floor that the veterinarian can sit on comfortably and techs can sit on and even the pet parent can sit on when appropriate so that the exams can be done comfortably without kneeling on the floor necessarily. So that's pretty cool. And then the ottoman has a cover that comes off you put a new one on for the next patient. And then on the right, I wanted to show you that this exam room is indoor outdoor. I have a couple other examples of that. And that sometimes it's helpful to be able to examine a pet right on the floor. So having a washable floor covering or something like that that makes floor exams a little more comfortable can be a really nice idea. And this one, I love this image for many reasons, but one of the reasons I love it is that you can see how you can incorporate some very special non-slip flooring, but just in, in spots. So this room has the rubber flooring, as I mentioned, rubber has the same coefficient of friction, wet and dry. It's naturally antimicrobial. And so this is a great flooring for exams. And I love how they've used the rubber flooring just in this one space. Um, and then they have mats that allow the floor exam to be more comfortable. So other considerations. We used to talk a lot about indoor outdoor exam rooms. They can be a little disappointing if you have a tenant improvement project or something where you can't incorporate them. So I do realize they don't work for all practices, but they can be really wonderful when they do work. And they are really wonderful in particular for end of life care. Um, there's nothing harder for a pet parent than, being, than saying goodbye to a pet. I know all of us can speak to that um, individually and personally. And to be able to do that in an outdoor environment can be much um, gentler than doing it inside. So I really, really love these for um, difficult consultations, end of life care, et cetera. And speaking of such, I think we still have a long, long way to go with end of life care and making end of life care more beautiful. And um, we tend to avoid it in our culture in general, talking about it. And we can do a lot with the design and thinking about how to make that last experience for the pet as gentle and lovely and wonderful as it possibly can be. 
So moving on to treatment environments, these are probably, oh, and I have to go back and tell you about this cat. This is Cucumber. He's one of the cats in our office and I absolutely love Cucumber. I love his eyes, aren't they beautiful? So let's talk about the treatment area. Um, the treatment area is really troubling because it's one of the most difficult spots in the hospital to design well. And the doctor and nurses and um, assistants have a lot to do in this space. They have to keep an eye on all the, all the patients and there's a lot going on in the space. So we don't have as many um, easy options. It takes a bit more brainstorming to figure out how we really reduce fear and anxiety in this space. But there are some critical things we can talk about. So this collaboration with Dr. Grandin happened during 2020, and I just was so concerned that I was I was going to be the person to give her COVID. So you can see uh, the sort of belts and suspenders, double masked kind of situation there. It also had two COVID tests. I was completely beside myself, worried about it. But um, Dr. Grandin was wonderful. I did not give her COVID. And um, one of the things that was really life-changing was seeing her come into this small animal hospital because she's actually never been in a small animal treatment space ever, ever. This was the first time. And seeing her take it in, and you know, this was a wonderful practice and they were so generous and open to let us come in and sort of observe it and kind of see what was working and what wasn't working from the eyes of a person who's particularly gifted with seeing situations. And Dr. Grannon noticed a lot of things. One of the things she noticed was the noise and cacophony of the space. Um, and also she noticed this cat that we were then taking a look at over here. This cat was in a cage and the cat's eyes were totally dilated. The cat was just absolutely terrified looking out of this cage at this space. And so she brought up how important visual blocking is and we talked and brainstormed about a lot of ways that we could achieve it in the in the veterinary space without really wrecking the operations or patient monitoring. So I really love to continue to challenge us in this this realm. In the shelter environment, which is another space where I work quite a bit, um, we think a lot about hiding and par partial view blockings, just giving the cat an option to get behind something without completely reducing the ability to see them. So that kind of silly little curtain there on the right is an example about how you could achieve that. Hanging a towel on a cage when medically appropriate can be something that you can do. When medically appropriate, you can give a, cow, a cat a place to hide. Cats um, will spend about 50% of their time hiding when given a choice. And so by denying that, um, you know, it can be stressful for them. So thinking about how we can enrich their housing environments to provide better spaces for them is key. Throughout my career, probably, I guess, maybe for the last 10 years, I've been really trying to have us think more about treatment curtains, which are used in human health care ubiquitously. And um, I remember having experience when I was in high school of cutting my finger um, actually all the way to the bone. Um, sorry to be gross, but I know most of you are veterinary <laughs> practitioners or uh, veterinary technicians, so you're probably not too grossed out. And when I got to the hospital, um, they it was kind of old style county, older county hospital situation. They didn't have curtains and it was just awful, <laughs> like awful. And so these, I realize that people are visual and pets are less visual, but this is just so easy. And these curtains, they can be snapped off and thrown in the washer and um, they can be come in lots of different colors. So it doesn't have to look like the 80s called and they want your curtains back. Like there's lots of good visual options. So on the right is a computer model showing how we might use this. And many of our clients actually have used these. We just don't have very many uh, professional photos of this. We have a few, um, maybe I should have thrown one in the slideshow, but people have reported they really like it because they can pull the curtains back if the patient needs monitoring and pulling it closed when they don't. I could go on and on. There's more things we can do with curtains, but you get the point and you can start thinking about them. One of the things I love for cats is, and actually for all animals, is just thinking about their sensory experience. And again, this is a rabbit hole I could go down into forever. 
But in this rabbit hole, we find out that um, cats are metabolically neutral at 82 degrees, which means that at 70 degrees, they're using metabolic energy to stay warm, which is crazy. So creating a warm space for them is really great. Um, animals recovering from surgery need a warmer space um, because their bodies cannot keep the warmth as they're recovering from anesthesia. So thinking about heat for animals that need it. I talked about how animals can hear outside the normal spectrum. That's amazing to me, absolutely amazing. And I'm gonna come back to that. And then of course, a dog is a walking olfactory brain lobe. That's what they are. They are like the world's best noses. They know things about us that I'm, I would be embarrassed to, to talk about, I'm sure. Um, but you know, I think thinking about the sensory perception of pets is really powerful. And here's a few images that show how we can take that concept and put it into action. So this picture on the right shows some heated cages. Um, these are made by Snyder Manufacturing. Casco cage on the bottom left is also heated and also has various lighting levels for different needs. So it's got a monitoring lighting level a resting lighting level, and then a cleaning lighting level where you remove the pet and it's got a UV light, which is useful for cleaning um, because you can see if the cage is, is has any organic material left in it. And uh, by the way, if you ever want to take this experiment, you take your woods lamp and shine it on your walls, you'll see if there's any organic material on your walls. So. Uh, let's take the, the great inspiration from how pets experience space and begin creating products and solutions and ideas um, to match. And taking it farther then with the treatment space, we can cut the hospital in half, and a few people have done this. This is an example of a hospital that really committed to both uh, separate experience for cats and dogs. The way that we thought about this is that the cat treatment is a really a miniature space. So the, the purple area is a miniature space outside the regular treatment area where cats are treated. Once cats are sedated or gone under anesthesia for surgery, they're no longer experiences, experiencing the space and they can be in the same area with dogs, if that makes sense. So when they're fully awake, they're in their own area once they're under anesthesia they're in a shared area. So this was quite efficient. So it doesn't have to be a full cutting in half, just a, a slight carving out for a mini clinic for cats. And so this is that example of the dog treatment space, which is a separate dog treatment area, and they have a separate cat treatment area. If that seems way too cumbersome, um, some other options are just creating a mini treatment space, which is right behind the exam areas, which you can use for cats but also can be used of what we call a run to the back room. So if you just need to do something quick, like a blood draw, instead of going into the cacophonous large main treatment space, you can use a minor treatment room instead, which I really like that idea. And then I also think about how we can create treatment spaces that allow uh, strategic monitoring of pets. So I love this nurse station because you can look at the pets from the station, but at the same time, the station itself provides a bit, bit of visual privacy for that pet that's on the left, for example. So that's kind of neat where you allow human monitoring, but the pet has a little visual privacy. And then we can also think about providing a little bit more low stimulation environment for the pet who might need it. Like the run that's in the corner of this space could be a low stim run. Again, what I'd love to see is a curtain track in front of some of these cages so that we can close the curtain and cut off that scary view whenever we want. And last but not least, we're gonna jump into the back of the hospital. And then after that, we'll talk a little bit about lighting and, and a little more about sound. So this is Kylo. Uh, Kylo is extra special boy, and he's probably one of my favorite pets at Animal Arts. Um, really love him. And so going into the kennel areas, um, these, these ideas, once again, from the guidelines are relatively accessible. We can, we can do them easily, but we can also go behind beyond them and think about how we can move our industry forward. One thing that the guideline does talk about is the difference between short-term care and long-term care. And this is very critical. I will have a closing story on this, um, talking a little bit about long-term care and how we think about it. But when we go into long-term care for pets, 
i.e., you know, a pet's hospitalized, so they're there overnight, we have to do a lot more for that pet than if they're there for three hours. And I think that's a really good thing to keep in mind. So I'm going to show you some examples of that, that changing philosophy depending on how long a pet stays. And I would say boarding is also long-term care because the pet is there over overnight. So for long stays or stays overnight, you can think of more enriched environments that are better for the pets um, and are larger and have more enriching activities during the daytime. Uh, what's nice about these little runs is that these are prefabricated, so they're not terribly expensive versus what we might do in an animal shelter where the pets might be staying for many days and they may have huge amounts of anxiety. This then needs to get pretty durable. So you'll notice a durability difference between this and the previous slide. Um, but even in these kinds of spaces, and I realize that you might work in private practice and this is not applicable, that's fine. It still has really good ideas like dogs not facing each other and uh, daylight streaming into this space so that the circadian rhythms can be maintained even if the dog's staying there for many days. And then I also want to think about uh, different housing for dogs that stay quite a long time. Um, this is a, wait for it, condominium complex for dogs in Florida. So there are some people who are very concerned, and probably most of us actually are very concerned about what might happen to our pets if we were to become you know, hospitalized or could not take care for them or if we were to pass away. And this um, condo complex takes care of pets um, that are under those circumstances. And so each of the dogs has an indoor outdoor suite that looks like wood, but it's tile. So just, just know we would not put a wood floor in a dog room. It's got an indoor outdoor porch and a bone shaped pool, of course. And speaking of fun things like that, you know, long stay dogs or dogs that are being boarded do need more enrichment. A tired dog is a happy dog. The outside space is almost as important, if not even more important sometimes than the indoor housing for dogs that are staying for several days. So I sort of feel like everybody needs a squirty tennis ball. That's what I feel. And then for our cat friends, um, long stay environments in hospitals can be something like this. Uh, with a separate litter box area. I actually tend to prefer a litter box area that's not double decker like this because it makes it hard for the cat to assume a normal position for using the bathroom. But the idea is that the housing needs to get larger and separated food and litter side. And then in a shelter environment, it gets even larger. Again, same analogies that the pet's there longer. Maybe it's even more durable. And so this is an example of what we use in a shelter. It's two compartment separating food and litter. And then the cat has that lovely view to the outside where they can see birds and butterflies. And incredible housing solutions. I could talk about housing for hours and hours, but I want to show you a few things with our, our cat wards that I think are are helpful to the cats. One of them is getting them off the floor. So in both of these pictures, you see cats being held off the floor. This has two purposes. The first is reducing fear, anxiety, and stress because cats hate to be housed at floor level. And the second is improved and superior monitoring, particularly in the image on the left because we have only two tier housing. It's a little hard to make easily monitorable cages that are three high. But these cages also have built in um, storage above with plumbing and oxygen and outlets. And there's an IV track in front, which could be a curtain track as well. So these are all some, some neat ideas about what we can do with cat wards. I love this hospital. This is still one of my favorite hospitals that I've had the pleasure to work on. Um, what I loved about this hospital is they had the mantra that everybody watches patients. You might be there cleaning the floor and your job is to watch patients, or you might be the internist. This was a special specialty hospital and your job is to watch patients. So even in this internal medicine room, they have a view into um, some critical patient areas so that everybody in this hospital is watching patients at all times. What they saw is a huge reduction in difficult outcomes following surgery because you can intervene if a pet is not doing well. And so there's visuals into all the different areas. 
little bit of a tiny side, but I've spent my um, years hoping that we can ventilate animal environments in a more useful way. And one of the things we can do is, is ventilate cages. Is this required? Absolutely, it's not required. But what I love about ventilated cages is that they reduce the air change requirement from before the room in which the animal is placed by about 30%. So by putting the air where it's needed, we therefore reduce energy costs overall. And of course, I think it helps the pet not to be with their own um, smells. And last but not least around this kind of part of the hospital is incorporating pet families. Um, and I'm going to talk just a minute about this at the very end of the slideshow. But, you know, in human hospitals, there has been an evolution to toward not separating the child from the parent. Trust me, I know that pet parents are not, often not helpful, <laughs> maybe sometimes not helpful or maybe always not helpful. But that bond is really, really strong. It's really important to, um, to everybody to stay connected as much as possible with the care that the pet's receiving. It also helps with a lot of transparency and trust. So as much as this is appropriate, given the type of hospital you have, um, it is something that a lot of people have recently experimented with doing. All right, now, ooh, I gotta go back. Um, yeah, so on this topic, this is Oliver, the cat, isn't he cute? Um, talk a little bit about the last bit, which is calming environments. So hospitals tend to be pretty loud, noisy, um, chaotic, and a lot of the things that happen in hospitals are, you know, really not required to be that way. And so I think this is the biggest area of improvement that we could possibly do is looking at noise reduction, better lighting, um, and, you know, separating noisy equipment. One great example of an innovation is putting a quiet hinge and a quiet latch onto cages. So that kind of horrendous squeaking and slamming that you often associate with cages is not necessary and can be solved through the right kind of equipment. We could also use equipment that reduces the amount of noise um, for cats. So cats are particularly sensitive to noise. And uh, you can use fiberglass cages in lieu of metal cages for our cats to create a space that's less loud and clattery. Now transitioning into lighting. Lighting is really fascinating because I open this by telling a story about the researcher who's noticed that buildings make a huge amount of noise outside the audible range. And uh, the question is, um, you know, is that harmful to people? It is. And is it harmful to pets? Most likely, because some of those noises are probably not well controlled. Um, so an example is moving our lighting to LED, which is really a building code standard anyway at this point. So LED lighting produces a superior quality of lighting, which you can see in the image on the right, which is more like natural daylight. So it has a sort of angelic and ethereal, well-balanced um, kind of look to it, which is truly remarkably much better. And so this is a great before and after of the old style fluorescence on the left and the beautiful new LEDs on the right. And I also believe that LED lights should always be dimmable in animal spaces because they see better in low light conditions than we do. And so we can dim them down again when medically appropriate, we can dim down those lights. And the other thing about LED lights, back to the noise bit, is that they reduce or eliminate any flicker or buzz. And that is because there is a driver, electronic driver, right in each fixture that transitions the alternate current we have in the US and Canada to direct current. And last is colors. When we first created the guidelines for Fear Free, people got particularly excited about the idea of colors. Well, there isn't much research on this, to be completely honest. Um, the idea with colors and creating calming colors in a Fear Free hospital is more about how we perceive colors and what it means to us culturally as people. So in Western cultures, um, nature-based, Colors, um, blues in particular, tend to be calming. 
and, and we perceive them as calming culturally, uh, so spa-like colors. And we want to remind our staff members who are working in this space to work with kindness, calmness, you know, deliberateness throughout their day. And so this is part of that cultural reminder. A great example of uh, an opposite example is the reason why fast food restaurants use reds and yellows. They want you to get finished with your Taco Bell burrito like this minute and get out the door. And by the way, I'm a huge Taco Bell fan. Don't ask me why. Um, but anyway, they want you out. They want you to eat and out. And so the red color is very activating. The reason why um, yellow notepads are yellow is because that's the best color for concentrating. So that's where this color philosophy came from. We tend to get a little bit hung up on it. It's not super important for pets. They do see more on the blue end of the spectrum. Dogs are dichromatic, so they don't see reds and oranges at all, but it's not something to be hung up on. So this last slide shows a beautiful exam room, which is using an activated color, but I think it's really beautiful. And we can absolutely use colors like this in the space. We just need to create a philosophy, um, a culture of caring, and really work on creating the backdrop for the work and the relationships. So as we summarize this, I want to talk just very briefly about um, an experience that I had with a pet and how that inspired me to think about how we can do a better job. And hopefully you have uh, experiences that will inspire you to do, to be thinking about new ways of doing things. Because absolutely everything we've learned at Animal Arts comes from a veterinarian or a veterinary technician or a practice manager. The, those, those people are so important to this wonderful business and moving it forward. And it truly is my favorite kind of business that is out there because you get to practice the way you want and you get to build the environments you want. So I'll just create uh, one quick snapshot here. Uh, many years ago, or at this point, uh, 2019, feels like a lifetime ago, I had a pet who went into I ICU following a very difficult surgery. And she was in ICU for seven days and unfortunately she passed away. During those seven days, because the veterinarians trusted me um, and the technicians trusted me, they allowed me to be in the space. You know, I, I spent a lot of time in veterinary hospitals, so I got unique privilege and I was very, very grateful for that, um, very grateful. So what was really important about that experience was that my dog pretty much didn't try unless I was there, which is why I spent a lot of time there trying to help her make it. In the end, she didn't make it. But what was, um, what was interesting about that was um, I'd never sat in a veterinary hospital, you know, in an ICU. I've never done it. I've designed them but I've never walked the walk. And it was pretty cool to walk the walk. Maybe it wasn't cool at the time, but it's really been inspiring to me since to see some of the things we can improve. So I saw things that kind of broke my heart um, about the, the team. One of them was um, the, the cages were created with a bar kind of on the front of the cage. I mean, runs, the runs had a bar in the front at the, at the floor level. You might know what I'm talking about. And the technicians were leaning on that bar, trying to take care of my pet or the pet in the next run. And I was, they were like bruising their knees. I'm like, we don't need that bar. That bar gets in the way of cleaning. It gets in the way of a lot of things. So just that simple thing that was like incredibly um, not dignifying for the person who's trying to do that work. Another example, and this related to my pet, was the fact that we could not differentiate the lighting in the space versus the lighting of the runs where my pet was being housed. And so we could not dim the lights between the two. And she was there 24 seven for, for seven days and the lights over those runs couldn't dim. And so over that entire time, she had that sort of um, really delirium inducing experience of being in under bright lighting, which destroys circadian rhythms after, you know, a few days, it's sort of disorienting, you don't know what time of day it is, you don't, your body's not working, and maybe it doesn't matter. And maybe it does. But it's such an easy thing, because actually dimming lights now is really, really simple. 
So now that we're using LEDs. So we could have designed that space and we, we did not design this space, but we could have if we had been in the position to design that space so that the runs dimmed and the rest of the space remained bright. Or we could design spaces where we use red lighting at night so the nurses can still keep an eye on the pet, but the pet can rest. So these ideas are at the time incredibly, incredibly important. Where even if they're really small ideas, they can be incredibly important for that pet or that person. And by working together, we can move the industry forward to much higher bars without making hospitals crazy expensive because this is all philosophy. The philosophy of whether you have a bar at the bottom of the run or whether you don't, that's not gonna affect the cost of the run, but it may make every bit of difference to that person or that animal. So with that, I will stop sharing and close out my presentation. I do want to tell you where you can get a hold of us. You can get in touch at animalarts.com. Info at animalarts.com is our info page. I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody um, about anything <laughs> and um, be a resource to you, whether you want to find a time to go out to Taco Bell together or whether you want to talk about ceiling tiles, I'm game.